welcome to the program today. I hope you've got your coffee. You know, I've heard one definition of coffee is liquid that is fresh ground from heaven. And I tend to agree and endorse that message. So happy you're here. God is so good. He's on the throne. Today we have a great program and we are talking about a kingdom message that many of us ascribe to in theory, but living it out and putting it into practice becomes very challenging. For example, our buddy Peter in Matthew 18, 21 and 22 goes to Jesus. No doubt he was in the middle of, you know, a day of ministry and teaching. And he says, how many times should I forgive my brother who keeps on offending me? Seven times? And I think Peter thought he was being really holy by suggesting that seven was a good number. And then in his uh, amazing style and finesse, Jesus answers him. No, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven in one day. Wow. I am sure that was not the message that he was expecting to hear. And yet what happens to us in our life? Well, we're offended. We get our feelings hurt. We're frustrated. There's misunderstandings all around us. Uh, things arise, big issues, small issues, and, and everything in between. And we are faced with the dilemma to forgive or not to forgive. That is the question. And we get to decide in each instance whether we are going to have an unoffendable heart. The only way we can do that is if we make a choice, partner with the Holy Spirit and ask for his help in extending forgiveness to ourselves, to, our, to others, to our parents, to teachers, to well-meaning adults in our past. And you know, here's another thought. How about if we make a decision to not only forgive things from our past, things in our present, but just to make a decision to live a lifestyle of forgiveness for anything that will happen in the future. That is one of the things that we strive to do as children of God. And my guest today is gonna share a very powerful story. You wanna stay tuned about uh, forgiveness, receiving forgiveness, forgiving himself, and extending forgiveness. Now, before we do that, let's go down the street uh, to the Homekeeper set and visit our friend Stephanie. She has an amazing recipe. It is chocolate covered bananas. Anything with chocolate, I'm there. So I cannot wait to see how to make this great recipe. Let's go join Stephanie. And I'm back alone in the kitchen <laughs> because Arthlene Rippey, as you know, decided to retire. And she was worried about what she was going to do, but I can promise you she is enjoying it thoroughly. She keeps posting on Facebook, 835, just got up, having tea in bed. Huh, okay, so I post little mean gifts of little girls waving a hairbrush at her. <laughs> She's enjoying her time, I promise you. She was here for so long. She blessed us for so many years and now it's time for her to just rest and be blessed. Although I don't think she's going to rest much. So my goal is healthy, yummy, frugal recipes for you guys. But in that, it doesn't mean it can't be um, a treat, right? So today we're gonna do chocolate covered bananas, frozen bites. So what I did, I took two bananas, I sliced them, I put them in the freezer, okay? And then I have a cup and a half of dark chocolate, which is good for you, right? I melted that in the microwave. I added a tablespoon of coconut oil and a pinch of salt. The salt accentuates the flavor. Don't skip that part, okay? It accentuates the flavor, it cuts down any bitterness. Little side uh, note. I love coffee, but sometimes it burns my stomach. If you put a little baking soda in it, 
it takes away the bitterness, so the salty part of that. So just a little side note for you. So I melted the chocolate. Watch it because you don't want it to seize up on you. So do it for a minute and then do it every 30 seconds and um, check it. Okay, so I have this yummy, delicious, dark chocolate with coconut oil and salt. Looks good, doesn't it? I also have chopped peanuts, I have chopped pecans, and I have some sprinkles. If you remember, I'm always telling you, get your children in the kitchen. This is the perfect recipe for that. Get your grandchildren in the kitchen. I promise you they will remember those days. Elect, my daughter remembers the days that she was in the kitchen with me. And she talks about it and still makes the banana bread that we used to make. So super, super simple. You're gonna take your frozen banana uh, pieces, you're gonna put them in the chocolate. So good. And then you're gonna put them on parchment paper. And then you're gonna wanna put your topping on immediately because the chocolate is going to get hard from the coconut oil. That's what the coconut oil does in your chocolate. It makes like a beautiful chocolate magic shell. That's why you don't wanna skip it. It doesn't really help with the flavor. And if you don't have coconut oil, it's okay. It will still work. Use what's in your house, right? So I'm gonna dip. It's a little messy, right? Oh, especially when my pan is so far away. Let your kids do all the toppings. Let them pick the toppings. Let them put on the toppings. And this is more healthy than say the chocolate cake I would like to have after lunch. I'll have a chocolate banana bite. It will take away my, it'll <clears throat> take away my want for sweets. And it's portion controlled. I'm trying people, I'm trying. There we go. And there's so many other toppings you could use. Use your imagination. Use what's in your pantry. Use what's in your house. So cute. That's all I'm gonna do for you. I'm not gonna sit through all of my bananas. So these are chocolate covered bananas, frozen bites. And let me show you the ones that I made earlier. Look how adorable they are. Oh, so cute. And I'm gonna try one because I haven't even tried one yet all morning. That is delicious. So good. Chocolate, nuts, banana, healthy. So good. So stay tuned. You'll know how to get this recipe. It'll come up on the screen. And I can't wait to see you guys again. Stephanie, I think I can eat those for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, bananas, chocolate, yes. So thanks for staying tuned. And I'd like to show you a video that will give you a little insight into our next guest. Take a look. New Year's is usually the deadliest day on roads across the country because of crashes related to alcohol. And in 2002, two families' lives were changed forever when a then 19-year-old man drove drunk and killed a woman in a wrong way accident. In the 15 years since, he has asked for and received forgiveness and is now dedicating his life to keep others, including his victim's nephew, from going down the same path. NBC's Carrie Sanders has his story. The John Templeton driving the car and the one in that mugshot are 15 years apart. Happened. I never planned to drink that night. I never certainly planned to drink and drive. Only 19 at the time, John drove his car drunk, speeding on the wrong side of a Tampa interstate, slamming into two cars, killing 18-year-old Julie Buckner. I think about Julie and just that this is the spot where, at 18 years old, you know, her life ended because of my choice. A drinking and driving story that, as you'll see, takes turns no one could have ever expected. It begins with a highly unusual admission, as the Highway Patrol report noted on the night of the accident, with a blood alcohol of .225, John Templeton confessed. I knew better than to drink and drive, he said. What will her family think of me? 
Wow. Before I introduce our guest today, what I didn't tell you before the clip is that that story involved me and my family. Julie Buckner was my baby sister, and she was 18 years old. And that incident began a healing journey, a redemption journey, and a forgiveness journey. And that is what we are here to talk about today. So may I introduce to you John Templeton. Thanks for being with us today. Jennifer, Thank it's you. a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. So that was almost two decades ago that that happened. And uh, the pain of it and the reality of it, it, it never goes it, away. No. And what's unique, I think, about this story is that according to the law and according to the court system and according to lawyers and wise counsel, we were really never supposed to meet or talk. And yet you defied all of that advice and all of those uh, suggestions. And I clearly remember the day that you came to the place where I worked and you and your dad said that you wanted to talk. I remember that as well. Um, and I'm always um, very moved um, and got to get emotional as well when I see the clips and, you know, see a young Julie. And, um, but, um, it's never, but easy. I, yeah. it's never easy to talk no, about. No, and I'm, and, and I'm sitting here so blessed and I'm so, um, I'm really so happy and so grateful to be here to discuss um, what I have been a recipient of is forgiveness and and the impact it's had on my life and hopefully the impact I've been able to have on others. And two decades later, you know, the 19 year old with the little scruff <laughs> and the South University of South Florida student um, who found himself in a position that he never thought he would be. And I never thought that um, I would be in this position, you know, two decades later. And um, I basically woke up from a blackout um, and I considered myself a, nor a normal college student, and I can look back in hindsight and see that there was uh, underlying issues developing and um, consumption of alcohol and binge drinking. And, um, and I woke up to a blackout, handcuffed to a hospital gurney, and being told by a state trooper, Corporal Bur Burke, and now I'm awake, I remember everything from this point on, told me, and he told me I was in a, a motor vehicle accident that resulted in the death of an 18 year old young woman on Interstate 275. And that moment um, hit me and it shook me in my core and I just felt like my life, I felt like my soul was shattered, I felt like my life was sucked out of me. And I was acutely aware at that moment that somebody that was just on this earth living their life happy and um, it was just this surreal feeling that they're no longer heal here and I knew that I was very acutely aware now that there's not a ripple, but a tidal wave that's about to hit her family um, with this terrible loss in this news. So, um, you know, 20 years later, I never, that moment, I didn't think I'd be sitting with you yeah. two years, 20 years later. Only God. <laughs> yes. Only God can do uh, things like that. <laughs> and um, our willingness to hear him you know, I remember the day that you came to the office and um, I, I remember going to the accident scene. I was only the only one in my family that did uh, just for identification purposes and, you know, to, to validate. And, um, but then I remember, you know, you coming. And I remember when they said, announced that John Templeton Sr. and Jr. were there. Uh, I started shaking and my heart was racing and I started crying and I um, remember saying, uh, my husband came in and said, can you do this? And I said, I want to. And I remember s saying, God, um, how do I do this? And the Holy Spirit impressed on my heart, you can forgive him now or you can forgive him later but you have to forgive him. <laughs> and um, I remember saying, I wanna forgive him now. 
I, I don't want to carry bitterness. I don't want to. I don't want to carry a grudge. I don't want to. I don't want to be offended. I don't want to ruin any more of life. And I thought that's what Julie would want. And I knew it's what Jesus would want, but Jesus being so sweet gave me an option. <laughs> and he let me choose. And I said, if you will help me, I want to forgive him now. And then that was the first time I came face to face with you. And I remember, you know, just seeing the sincerity and the, the vulnerability, the fear, the regret in your eyes. And that made it easier, I think, you know, um, than somebody, you know, that didn't take responsibility and that didn't want to make amends. And I think that was such a huge, important heart issue. And I remember just being so impressed that at 19, you cared, you, you know, that you cared and that you wanted um, God to intervene in, in this horrible, messy, tragic, very fatal and final, you know, situation as it pertained to my sister. But I know that there was a long journey from that day forward. So what are some of the, what are some of the struggles, you know, throughout that first year, two years, three years that you went through in just wrestling with yourself and, in uh, and walking through that? Um, you know, Jennifer, I, I look back, I, um, I was brought up in the church. Um, you know, I, I remember years ago um, as a Catholic re reading, receiving my first Holy Communion and in second grade, I put a little holy water in my bedroom and I forgot about that for years. And I, you know, it was cool at the time and I, I liked prayer and I liked, you know, asking for guidance and I, and I loved the Lord. And then I look at time went by and I got complacent. Um, it was foxhole prayers and I think about that moment meeting with you and I know that that was the guy under there the whole time that really always wanted to do the right thing and um, you know through just a lot of the temptations and um, probably insecurities and fears and we make choices as as young people and, and, and adults that I think lead us astray yeah. and I desperately wanted to come back you know and um, when I felt distant it wasn't God that moved away it was John mm -hmm. and um, and I desperately needed him there and, and um, I was surprised too um, that you were there uh, because we were invited to come to the place that you worked and um, uh, you know I knew I was guilty there was like it was I, I, I felt terrible for this family I try I had a younger I still have a younger sister and I think if somebody I have kids now and I think if somebody this happened I'd be so angry and so hurt but I would act, at least want to act how I would want that person to act and um, to try to, you know, extend, you know, just how sorry I was. And um, I, I know that that was my personal hell. Um, I, I, I felt so depressed. I felt so low. I don't felt at that moment, though, in that time period, um, I did, had no future. I didn't see um, any deservingness of forgiveness on, on, on my part or, or anybody. And, um, I mean, that changed my life. Whether I was gonna to go to 15 years in prison or not, like that moment of you and your husband, Rob, and embracing after that and holding hands and praying, it, it, was, it, was, um, it was a divine experience. And it was a divine intervention that I knew that God was there and, uh, and he could carry me through this, through this period. But it was, um, it was a struggle for a long, long time. I felt like a broken man. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I love how you said, uh, you know, when we do forgive and you know, Jesus was clear about it, it, it is divine. You know, forgiveness is divine. And it, it's what Jesus preached and it's what he calls us to do. It's not easy, it, it's not easy. And I think sometimes we withhold forgiveness as humans uh, against ourselves and others because somehow we think that by forgiving, we're saying that what the other person did was okay and that it gets them off the hook or it releases them. And I know you struggled with that as well. I, I, exactly. So um, I think, you know, you would ask me and other people would ask me, you know, have you forgiven yourself? And I felt like it was 
wrong to say yes or it was wrong that John would ever forgive himself yeah. because in my mind, I mean, it was really, really wrong. It was a selfish decision. It was, there was just so much self-absorption and, and that act that led to that. And, um, you know, I didn't reali realize though that really I was just thinking of myself and I was caught up in myself and, um, you know, I don't think, I'd never say that that's okay, obviously, you know, and I know how deeply I hurt people, but I, I've come to the process of, of, you know, I have a wonderful family that loved me and I had people that were loving me and giving me forgiveness that, and I always say that I didn't deserve. And, and really that set the path for me. I kept praying, I kept trying to do the right thing. And for me, I think I had to get into action as well yeah. because um, I really thought about Julian and you know, this young woman can't walk into this classroom and tell you how great life was until a drinking and driving accident, you know, an underage drink led to her, you know, losing her life. And, um, but I was me and, and, and I had the opportunity to do that for both of us and yeah. to try to make that change. Yeah. So, um, you know, I realized that I had to forgive myself and, and never did I ever say that it was okay, but yeah. I had to forgive myself to really be beneficial and, and to be of service to other people. Cause I was 19. Yeah. Was I going to spend the next 60, 70 years of my life in, in self-pity and yeah. depression and That's then right. be a drain on society or my loved ones? Or, or, or could I, you know, one way to, one tiny way to make amends is to change your behavior. Yeah. I could never, I, I had to do everything I can to, enable, to make sure that nothing like that ever happens yeah. again and do what I can to help other people from not making that happen. Yeah. And, um, and, and I felt like that was my journey. And, and today I can look in the mirror. I love holding my five and seven year old daughters. They kiss me on the cheek at the same time. It's our thing in the morning. And I love that I'm a dad for them. And um, I, don't, I know that I would have been, been there and able to be there for them and, and be of service to other people without first forgiving myself. Yeah. And um, you know, one thing I do share though quickly, I remember in that hospital bed, before my parents came up to the um, hospital to see me, being charged with DUI manslaughter, and the state trooper told me that the victim's sister, you know, Julie's sister, went to the scene of the crash. I knew that happened by the state trooper telling me, and that the uh, that her sister called the hospital to check to see how the young person was doing, just because she hoped two lives weren't ruined. So, well, what you just described is recovery, and it's restoration, and it's. Uh, taking, you know, something heinous and making it beautiful. And um, I'd like to just go to a video to show quickly what you are doing right now. Footprints Beats Out Recovery, it's a, it's a boutique style treatment center for people with addictions and dual diagnosis issues. Footprints is unique because um, we have a very small census, so um, small group settings so we can really work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there's the buzzword for individualized treatment and care, but this truly is individualized. It's all, it's all client-centric. Um, if we err, we are probably on the side of uh, having too much staff. If we're anywhere to 15 to 18 in clients, that's, that's the number that we have. We have about 16, 17 employees, so there's always a one-to-one -one ratio. I just encourage anybody to ask any other place what their ratio is, staff to clients. They care about us individually. You're not just a number. They want to see us do well. That's why I can call any person here at any time of the day or night. They're going to answer and make sure I'm okay. And that I know is unique to this program. So Footprints Beachside Recovery Center was established in 2008. That's correct. And it was, it, your, your journey, the forgiveness, the redemption, the receiving the forgiveness, the deciding not to give up on life and to wallow led to, uh, a ministry Indeed. that is helping others and equipping others and enabling others to receive uh, freedom from addiction. And what I love about this, John, is it's not, this was not part of your sentence. This is your heart. Now, I'm sure some are wondering, well, what happened in the court system? And so, you know, very quickly what happened is that when you went to trial, 
that day. The judge said it was the most emotional case he had ever had. He said that the courtroom was more full than he'd ever had a courtroom, and there were extra bailiffs there, and many people came and testified on both sides. And then the most touching part of that court experience was when, once again, I'm sure against your counsel, and in front of what could have been a lot of hostile people, you turned around and you addressed everyone there from Julie's family, and you wept and you shared your heart and you begged for mercy and grace and forgiveness. And the judge wept over this case, and he um, decided to give you a very unusual sentence that did not involve 15 years of your life behind bars, but what did involve is you going out and speaking and working with young people for thousands of hours, of you having a picture of Julie on your, on, on your person at all times, and many other things. But even when all of those things were complete, I love that you decided that you were going to use your story, this story to help others. So, so tell me how that was kind of birthed in our last little minute here. Sure, I mean, it, it's, I, 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 God just led me into it. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, we had a, an opportunity to open up a small business that we realized, guys, we were helping, you know, stop drinking. They had other issues. And so yeah. we put them together with a therapist and then we said, well, we should get a license. And we never knew it would be a business. We never knew it would be a, uh, uh, you know, a, a licensed treatment center. And you know, I never knew that I'd be the president of a, of a drug and alcohol <laughs> rehab. And um, you know, I love what I do every single day. It's challenging. And um, you know, I think God prepared me for this moment to help others that are struggling. And yeah. it's you know, the number one cause of death right now from 18 to 43 year olds in the United States is overdose. And, <sighs> You know, it was 17,000 just a couple of years ago. So we have a huge problem in our hands, and um, but I'm glad that I'm, I'm just so fortunate and blessed yeah. that I'm in this position yeah. to, to now turn what Pastor Jennifer, what Jennifer told me a long time ago, I'll never forget, turn my mess into a message and my test into a testimony. And that hit me in my heart, and that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I appreciate it. We could talk for hours. I'll have to have you come back, uh. and we'll unpack more. But I just want to encourage you, you know, forgiveness is messy, it's difficult, but with God's help, you can forgive, you can release, you can receive forgiveness. And the New Testament says, uh, when much forgiveness is given, uh, much love is given. And we've seen that in John's life by him extending love to others. I encourage you, extend love to forgive and ask Jesus to help you forgive. Forgive yourself.